Welcome to Headlines. This is David Lichtenstein. This week, our show will be about children at risk, challenged with all the problems and the multitude of issues we have bringing up children in what is probably the most challenging generation ever to bring up children. I would suggest that there are many children that by the time of 13 or 14 have seen more than your grandfather saw when he was 80 in his shtetl. So we have a fabulous uh, panel of guests. We have Rabbi Yisrael Grossberg, who's the dean of Benos Chaya Academy. He says a school where the only girls they take in are those who can't get in anywhere else because of either substance issues, etc. We have Rabbi Y.Y. Rubinstein, author author of On the Derech, we have Tzvi Gluck, the great tzaddik of our community who runs Amudim, and he says his entire rubric, his entire uh, geist is working with people in crisis, particularly children in crisis. We have Mrs. Ruchama Klapman of Mask, Mothers and Fathers Aligned to Save Kids. And then we have Yehuda, one of the success stories, people who one person cared, that person may have been you, and intervened on his behalf, and he was a substance abuser, and many abuser of many other things too, and now he is clean and doing wonderfully. Before we begin, let me share a thought with you, my dear listeners. The children we speak to, or the kids, or the teenagers, and there are many, I, I would suggest that everybody you know knows somebody who has a child at risk. Everybody listening knows somebody at risk. And it's a real problem. We'll hear Tzvi Glock talk about we have two suicides a week. That's over 100 a year that he personally does the Tahara for. Frightening numbers. So here are two of the things that the children will say, and the parents, they suffer from judgmentalism. We look at them, and in our eyes, our noses, the way we wrinkle our faces, they know they're not good. They know they're not good enough. They know they're not dressed appropriately. They know they're not, their marks aren't appropriate. They know their productivity is inappropriate. They know it, and they feel it, and it hurts. And grief, and they strike out, and then they start cursing and acting violent because nobody likes to be a reject. And you know who else gets judged? Parents. <laughs> what type of a parent are you anyway? They see it in the supermarket and in shul. When their kids, their children come in again, maybe with the funny haircuts, or maybe not, just not showing up at school, and people whisper, pss, 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 pss. judgment, and we judge them. What type of a parent are you? So I want to say a small thought on judgmentalism. And judging other people. You know, Yaina, we speak about him on Yom Kippur. He was asked by God, by Hashem, to go and to tell Ninveh to repent. They had done wrong. And what does he do? He says, go, save Ninveh? Nope. Runs and jumps into a boat, has his amazing encounter uh, in the deep sea with a whale. But the question is, why wouldn't he? And there are Mepharshim that say, but I want to... Suggest a different shot. Yaina's name is Yona ben Amitai, the son of Amitai, the honest man. And it's a, a nom defend. What does it mean? It means basically his pen name was Yona, the man of integrity, the son of honesty. And you know what Yona said? Honesty? I'm an honest man. All those kids? Fe. Those parents? Fe. Ninve? Chuva? They're bad people. What, just say, Chatasi, Avisi, Pashaiti, make it all go away? Turn the other cheek? Like, who are we fooling? I'm an honest person. I lived my whole life with honesty. I don't think. Do you know that here in the United States, they want to do forgiveness of people who are default of mortgages? And you know that 80% of other consumers say, I paid my whole mortgage on time. Why should you get off free? They don't want to know that the other person may struggle, may have lost a job, may have a sick parent, a child, etc. So he's an honest man. And you know what else I have a proof of? It says when he's in trouble and he's misspelled Hashem, he says, Hashem kill Rachel Machanan Erech Apaim Verav Chesed, and he stops with Emes. He says, Emes, truth, is not one of the Midas Arachmim. It's not a Midas of forgiveness. A person should be honest. 
But but Jonah's not right, right? He's he's censured for this. And what is the reason? Because Emmis, there's not one Emmis. There's more than one Emmis. Your Emmis and my Emmis could be very different. And it's not only that, you see in the Midas, it says Rav Chesed the Emmis. That means Rav Emmis, much Emmis. What do you mean much Emmis? There's only one Emmis. But it's not true. There's more than one. There's your truth and my truth. And you grew up with different parents or maybe with no parents or with one parent. Some earned a living. Some didn't earn a living. You may be tall. You may be short. You may have a smarter brother than you, a smarter sister than you. It may be in yeshiva, in school. You just didn't, you couldn't do it. You had ADD genetically. He, or maybe he had. So is your MS and my MS the same one? Do you know in halacha, we have tefillin of Rabbeinu Tam and Rashi. And what does the Prima Godim say? He says, L'divrei ha-mekubalim shnehem emes. <laughs> Imagine, two different, how could there be two truths? Right? What's the halacha? The, uh, we say every time, it says, Ein mikri, the Ramban in Shei says, he says, there are two truths. There's the pshat and there's the drush. It says, and they're both true, he says, even though they're very different. Ramban Lahalacha, right? And the Sefer Mitzvahs. What do we say in Brachas? Machloikis Rabbi Hudin Rabbanan on something so simplistic as to what is the nighttime? Does evening start by Mincha or does evening start by Shkia? And what is the Halacha? They're both true. Marked Avid, Umarked Avid. There's more than one truth in Halacha. The Marami Panu, the great Makobol, in Maim Chakoy Radin, in Chelik Beit Parak Yuzayin, he says every time there's a Machlek is in the Gemara. He says one is Halacha Lamaisa and one is Halacha Veloy Lamaisa, but it's also Halacha. There are many truths, right? When we say B'Tzedek Tish Beit Ami Secha, because there are more than one ways. There is your truth, my truth. They're different truths, and they could both be true. You know, we say the famous story, this couple comes to a rabbi and they're having an argument and he says, oh, my wife, she did this and this and this. It, she's so guilty. And he says, you know, you're right. And then the wife says, him? Oh, such a schlamazel. She said, he looks at her and he says, you're right. So they both look at him and they say, how could we both be right? And he says, you know something? You're right. But there are many truths as we grow up. And you know who else suffered from this? Noyach. What does Desire say? He says, Noyach was Midas Hadin. Noyach believed. Here's a question for you. Everybody knows since your children. 120 years, Noyach said, and he, he prophesied on the calamitous events that are going to come, the apocalypse, the Mabel. How many people did he convince in 120 years? Zero. Now I ask you. Rashi says Noyach was the greatest industrialist of his era. He invented the plow. He was the Elon Musk. He was the Thomas Edison of his generation. Could you imagine Elon Musk sold 350,000 cars in two days when he came out, announced a new product, which may or may never happen. That's in, in one day he sold 350,000. People lining up. Nayak, 120 years, he couldn't convince a single person? And the answer is only one possibility. You can't convince anybody if you don't believe it's true or if you don't want to convince. And what didn't Noyach believe is true? He said, this is a terrible generation. It's a generation of Arias, of Gezel, Androla Musya Balaylam. It's bad. Get them to repent? I don't understand where they're coming from. These are bad, bad people. And that's why he couldn't get one person. Noyach judged. And when does Noyach stop judging? When he comes out of the Teva and there's bodies piled up, bodies of his friends, his family, his uncles, his aunts, his brothers, his sisters, his wife's brothers and sisters, everybody he knew, bodies all over. And what does he see? He sees a rainbow. And what's a rainbow? A thousand colors, each one different, each one beautiful. He said, aha. And what does Hashem say? I shall not curse the world again. I cannot see now. The opposite of Midas Hadin, of the SLA Kim, is seeing how many different ways there are, how many different challenges people are, how each of us is so different, how we understand things differently, how we can get hurt and be vulnerable so differently. 
That is the story of Noach. And Avram learns from this. When Avram comes to Sodom, Sodom is the arch enemy. Much, much worse than any kid at risk. They did the worst imaginable things. They put honey on a girl till she's died to death because she gave somebody something. And what does Avram say? Avram tries five times to be mispal for Sodom because he understood. The Medrash says Avram understood everybody. That is the beauty. So do we want to go when we look at parents or children who are struggling, do we want to look at it like Yaina did? Like Noyach, pre-Diluvian, before the Mabel? Or do we want to look at it like our grandfather Avram, and he's, when he says, Hashoifet kala aretz, and the Medrash says, everybody's so different. How could, Rabbi Nisholm, how could you be Shoifet kala aretz in this Midas Hadin? You're listening to us on WMCA, or w, that's 570, or WMCA.com. Or you may be listening to us on the Nachum Siegel Network. That's at NachumSiegel.com. And we're also on Nachum Siegel at 11 a.m. Monday morning. Our first guest will be Tzvi Gluck, whose boots are on the ground, dealing with these crises day to day. From Brooklyn, New York, the Askin who deals probably most with kids of risk who are probably at the most dire points in their life. Harav Tzviglok, who is truly a tzaddik in his involvement and his mysterious nefesh to those in our community who are struggling the most. Welcome, Reb Tzvi. Shalom Aleichem, David. How are you? Good. Could you tell us how much of a problem is it, children at risk? You know, I, I got to be honest, I, I really don't like that terminology. I'm going to preface by saying that. I don't know who decides what is and what isn't at risk, but the problem of children suffering and being in pain is unfortunately a lot greater than most people want to believe. How is that so? I don't know any person today that doesn't know someone within their own family, within a friend's family, or at the very least a neighbor's family, that doesn't have a child who's in pain. Define in pain, Ripsi. In pain. In pain can be anywhere from children who are acting out because they've been abused, because they've been neglected, because they've had learning disabilities or history of mental illness, and people don't know how to deal with them. So therefore, they try to create their own path, which many times is a very destructive one, including drugs, criminal activity, promiscuity, and the Rabbi Shalom only knows how much more. And h- how do you know it's such a problem? Like, could, wh- wh- like, what's the trail that you see that leads you to say this is a serious problem that we have to deal with? I've been in this field for over 15 years now. And years ago, when I first got involved, the biggest issue we dealt with were 17, 18-year-olds that were smoking too much weed or maybe drinking a little bit too much alcohol. Now we're dealing with 13 and 14-year-olds using heroin and finding any method possible, including hurting themselves both physically and emotionally, to be able to find the funds to be able to continue these habits. And, and, and is that really a problem in our community? I guess we'll let the numbers speak for itself. We've had 64 tragic deaths under the age of 35 since Rosh Hashanah this year alone. Which is around six months, which is around, you're saying it's almost, it's, it's close to 10 a month? Eight a month. The numbers we have are about eight a month, or simply stated, two a week. And what is it? Is, are these, you're talking about suicide, overdose, like what would you, how? A, a combination of everything. I think the numbers we put together showed that uh, 20 of them were actual suicides, and the other 44 were drug and alcohol related deaths. So, what is the leading cause of it? It's, in our community, we really don't have the types of statistics that I would like. Can I tell you that on the suicide front, most of the people that committed suicide were victims of sexual abuse? Yes. Can I tell you that a large percentage of people that committed suicide had untreated or not treated enough mental illness? Yes. Can I tell you that on the drug addiction alone, that many serious addicts, and I say serious addicts, I'm talking about people that are using drugs day and night, getting any high they can, have a very, very deep-rooted trauma, which almost always 
comes from abuse? Yes. Can I tell you that it comes from broken homes? I'm sure there's some t- statistics to that as well. In our circle, what we're seeing, the largest percentage is victims of abuse, be it sexual, physical, emotional. And after that, the second highest group is those that are suffering from mental illness. Wow. What are the early warning signs that a parent should look out for? So we're actually in the middle of trying to put something together and comprehensive. But the, the earliest sign that we've been able to really use and have a lot of clinicians back us up on are uncommon pattern changes when children start acting different than what they normally are. And this can be what might seemingly be a good pattern change as well. You know, we've had children that went from being mediocre students to all of a sudden being straight-A students in an unhealthy, quick time. Or the other way around, people that are normally doing well in school that all of a sudden start failing. Or people that used to take care of themselves and come in to class neat and taken care of that all of a sudden stopped caring about their looks. Or on the younger children, acting out a lot, fighting a lot, not listening to authority at a young age. You know, these are all early detections that are indicative that something is wrong. We may not know exactly what. A change in behavior. A change in behavior, exactly. A pattern of behavior. And so why do kids then migrate to drugs? So uh, really there's two different categories. I mean, there are some kids, you know, one of the guys in my office likes to always tell me, Sometimes kids use drugs just because it's fun, and um, there is a large category in that as well. But from those that are looking to take away the pain, anything that can alter their normal self and put them into a state of relaxation or to put them into another alter personality gives them a little bit of, in their own mind, of nachas, that they're able to push away the pain that they went through. So it might start off with one drug, And then when that drug doesn't do it, they might go to another drug or a higher dosage or more of it because while they're in that high, that becomes their new reality that doesn't include this painful part of their life that they're trying to escape from. Let me ask you a question, Reb Tzvi. So, Rahman al a person has a kid whose behavior has changed and they realize they were either a victim of some type of abuse, emotional, physical, sexual, etc. What does a parent do? So the first thing I always say is the parent should not start questioning their kids too much because you don't want to start creating memories or making things blown out of proportion, but they should immediately seek professional, clinical help from people that are trained to deal with this. And I'm not trying to machavek from the askanim that do a very good job, but at the end of the day, people that go to school to become therapists, psychologists that know what they're doing are the first line of defense to being able to diagnose what's really going on. Right? It's, it's, it's unfortunate. And again, I had a very uh, rav call me today and said that, what I've been doing lately, putting out some videos and sending out emails and bringing this to light, is, 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 is quite possibly a chilol Hashem. Why don't you ask this Rav to come to the Taharis? That was exactly. I actually asked the Rav to join was, me when I go to the Can I ask Shiva. you what the name of this Rav was? I, I, I don't feel comfortable. Um, I, I have the phone number for Relief Resources. What would that be? 718-431-9501. Thank you so much for joining us. Call to all the best. Bye. Let's go to the world famous BBC broadcaster. I think this is the first time we've had a BBC broadcaster on the phone, Rabbi Y. Y. Rubinstein, who recently wrote a book on this topic. And he's written a book called On the Derech. He's the author of many Sfarim, including one that recently came out two weeks ago called Rafuas Halev. Uh, on the uh, section of Shara Betachin of the Chayvis Halvavis. But he is an expert of children, both, I guess, off and on the derech, based on his book called On the Derech. Welcome, Rabbi Rubenstein. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be with you. So, Rabbi Rubenstein, if you had to give us the reasons, why do children go become at risk? What drives children to drugs, to uh, leaving yeshiva, to other wayward behaviors? What would you say that is? I would say there are probably four reasons, and really these four reasons, or at least three of them, were a trigger for the writing of the book, which you very kindly mentioned before, 
on the Derech, which has got 21 answers to 21 serious questions that young people, and occasionally Rabonim, asked me because they were struggling with finding a good answer to. Uh, the first reason I would say that kids sometimes are at risk, in fact, often are at risk, is because they come from difficult family backgrounds. There is tremendous poverty. In Israel, that's particularly a problem uh, in from places like B'nai Brak, uh, where, you know, their parents are very often 100% committed to Torah Lishma, and that might mean a life of poverty. Um, so difficult family backgrounds, including, sadly, as we know today, the terribly high incidence of divorce. Uh, another reason um, for children going off the derech is them being rejected from schools. And what would be the third reason? So we have poverty, dysfunction in the family, suffering in the family, children yep. who, who suffer rejection at school. Yeah. Give me the third. Um, and the third is when they ask questions in the, so we're in the school, but then they ask a question. And for asking a question, which is a, a fundamental and important question, they are branded apicarsim, thrown out of the classroom, thrown out of the school. And, uh, and when I wrote this book, the people who, who held on to this book most tightly, particularly those who borrowed them from my children, and failed to return them past all the deadlines, were the Mechanskim in the Beis Yaakovs and the Yeshivas, because now they had an answer. The reason they were throwing the kid out wasn't because of an apicarsish a question. Often it was a very straightforward and honest answer, a question. It's just the Rebbe didn't have the answer, and particularly if it was the Rebbe, since she didn't have the answer. So to hide her own embarrassment, she threw the kid out. In my humble opinion, and may I quote Rashi, but, you know, people might want to doubt his orthodox uh, um, credentials these days, but Rashi points out in Mishpatim, when it says, Eleha Mishpatim, Mishav Tosim Lithnehem, these are stats that you put before them, and he's intrigued by what it says, why it says Tosim Lithnehem, and he famously records that there was a conversation between Hashem and Moshe Rabbeinu, and he says, Al sal al daitcha, said Hashem to Moshe. Don't think it should enter, it will enter your mind one, that you'll teach the halacha once, twice, three times, ad shete sudra bapiem until they know of by heart, and you won't bother yourself to tell them the reason why the halacha is like it is and isn't like it isn't. Rather, it should be like a shulchan amrach. With everything you need for the meal on the table, the tablecloth, the cutlery, the crockery, the salt, the pepper, everything you need. That's what the Torah has to be as well. So every question is legitimate. Well, so how, how does how does Masida Shishorim begin? Yisoyed Hakasida Shishorim Shatam Avoida Tamim, who she's Barabi Samasa Odom Achabas Avoidam. A person has to know clearly what it's all about. So there's no such thing as an apicorsish question, I think. Apicorsish answers, which are presented as questions, but every question is legitimate, as long as you, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's offered in the spirit of, please answer this, like the Chochem does, saying we just finished Pesach, because of the whole Shakra Bataria about the similarity between the question of the Rosh and the Chochem, but the Chochem still wants an answer, the Rosh doesn't want an answer. So if a kid asks a good question, why throw him out? Throw her out. Get yourself a better Chinach teacher so you can answer the question. Can you give us an example of a question that you find that young people struggle with? Oh, well, well the obvious one is one that we all struggle with, and that is Tzadik Aralui. And I say because I just had the enormous privilege of uh, translating Sharbatoch and Chobos Obavos in modern language. A very, I remember once I was giving a share in London, um, there was about, I think, a thousand people there, and the, the MC of the evening said to me, we've got, room, we've got three minutes left, we've got room for one more question. So somebody popped their hand and said, why did God let the Holocaust happen? <laughs> so... <laughs> So, uh, forgive me if I, I'm not really able, I'm not running away from it, I say I've written books on the subject, I've got this in Shirim, and I'm quite happy to come and talk about it. It's just too complex it, it's to a give big, a soundbite for you. It's a, yeah, it's too big for a soundbite. I've got a Shir, I think it's online, called Why Do Very Bad Things Happen to Very Good People? Uh, which I'm sure you'll be able to get free, um, or people will be able to listen to free. I'm very happy for them to do so. Um, it, but it takes an hour to talk. This is a big, big issue. And I talk, I talk incidentally, as somebody who lost his late wife to cancer. So, uh, you know, I, I do know a little bit about why the, you know, bad things happen to very, it's a very good people. My wife was, my late wife was a very good person. And that's important, incidentally. Uh, I write, an, I wrote a book, oh, <laughs> I wrote a book about this, which I have the chutzpah to say that people should own, everybody should own. It's 
called The Little Book for Big Worries, Dealing with Serious Illness. Um, because we all will and all should be dealing with somebody who's very not well. At some point in our life, it might be a close friend or it might be a cousin or it might be a sibling, certainly a parent or a grandparent, you want to know how to do it well. So that, if you get hold of that, uh, there's a whole, that, that, the answer to the question is a whole long chapter in there, why the very bad, bad, bad things happen to very good people. But it's, it's not a soundbite. Okay, so the third reason then would be the inability of Mechanchem to answer the most curious minds. Yes. And, and, and well-educated and more not in the ghetto. Today, children are not in the ghetto anymore. Anybody who has access to a newspaper, to, God forbid, an iPhone, they will have genuine questions. And yes. the Mechanchem are simply not equipped. So we are blaming, we basically shift the blame from Mechanchem sometimes inability to answer on to the children, and that would you say is the third reason. Are there any other, was there any other reason would come to mind? Yes, there is, and it's a bigger one, and it's a, one that I didn't mention, and I'll tell you about that in just a second, but I would like to add that the Mechanchim themselves, who often fail to give the answer or hide their embarrassment by rejecting the child, are very often extremely talented and good people. It's just that they were not equipped with the answers to the questions. Um, and that's a shame, because I said, when people get hold of that particular book, and I'm sure there are other books too, when they're given the ammunition, they fight a good fight. So there's, some, there's something critically wrong with the system that isn't equipping our mechanchim uh, enough with good Hushkofa questions to answer these. I, inc- I mean, incidentally, Rabbi, some... Rabbi Rubens, let, sure. let me again interrupt, but it says by the Ben Harusha, Ba'af Ate Hake Ishinov. Yes. And most people erroneously teach Hake Ishinov to be smite him on his teeth. Yeah. <laughs> but it's but it's erroneous because hake is spelled with a kuf and not with a chuff. So even right. though they're read with the same, it's like here H E R E and H A I R. They right. mean two totally different things. Right. And hake means to blunt exactly. it literally means to blunt his bite. Excellent. The Rush has asked a very cutting question. Right. And one way to do it is to run out and hide, and the other reason is is to have the answer. And let me tell you a, a story. When I lived in Lakewood years ago, we were sitting around the Shabbos table, and there was a knock on the door, and it was a few um, uh, Jews for Jesus were there. Right. And they came in, and I wasn't there, and my guest answered the actually a, ge- a guest family member answered the door and he slammed the door. I said, what happened? He said, it was a Jew for Jesus. I said, so what happened? He says, well, you know, I won't talk to them. With a look of consternation on his face. I said, on the contrary, let's invite them in. <laughs> and they came in and I said, so tell me about yourself. And they pulled out, you know, it says in Isaiah 4, it says, and he will pierce you. I said, well, I have an Isaiah here. Let's look it up. I said, it doesn't say we will pierce you. You're just reading. Do you read Hebrew? No, we don't read any Hebrew. So, <laughs> And after a half an hour of listening to them and case by case, pulling out a Chumash and a Tanakh and rejecting the answer, suddenly one looks at the other and he says, we really have to leave. This is, we're, we're in a big <laughs> r- And they both ran out. So, Haki Yashinov means yeah. blunt his teeth, know the answer. Yeah, yeah. So, because there's nothing more powerful than a Rebbe having the right answer. Yes, Yes, I think you're 100 percent right. What would be the fourth? The fourth. Thing, well, the fourth one is the the one that we really don't want to talk about. But actually, in Kolikavod to the from world, I never thought they would talk about this, but now we are. And when I published this piece, which started off as Edna Hamadia, I had a phone call from a lady uh, who would not give her name. And you realize when when rabbis are phoned by people with problems who won't share their name, that it's obviously a very deep problem. She said, you wrote but three reasons why kids go off the dark rabbi, there's a fourth. And she paused, and I said, oh, you mean sexual abuse. And then she, I heard a little noise in the background, she said, I'm a survivor. And this woman came from a very prestigious home, a Hasidic home in this particular case, although it doesn't have to be. And she was, I mean, I don't know the age group of, uh, of the people listening to, the, to your show, but... Uh, uh, she suffered the worst at the, hand of her, uh, at the hands of her father, if you follow. And this lady gets shiurim. They now move in there, live in there, so her husband is a maggot shir. The damage that is done. Now, what is the instance? What is, or rather, what's the, t- the statistic of the, 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 the phenomenon we're talking about? So uh, I, have a, I have a relation through marriage who's called Rabbi Dr. Shimon Russell, who lived in Lakewood until very recently. He's moved to Israel. And somebody called Rabbi David Revson, who is, I think, one of the cleverest and certainly straightest men 
in the world, and he is, I mean, the number of Meisters Habonas that he's created is enormous, yes. from the Bay through the, yes. the whole spectrum. Both came up with the exact same figure. Girls going off the derech, 85% have been sexually abused. 85%. 85%. And boys? Boys, I'm not sure. They, it's not far off it. It's right. not far off it. And it's normally, I'm going to say something which is going to be extraordinarily unpopular with your listeners. And maybe it's because I'm British. Uh, most, he's, I was told by both, most of the abuse that happens to boys is not the Rebbe, etc., although that is obviously headline and horrible. It often takes place by other boys, and particularly at the most ridiculous um, institution I know of in the world called summer camp. The American summer camp. Just take, send your kids away for six weeks or two months in the summer away from you uh, with counselors who are maybe two years older than the kids, and uh, they'll have a great time. If I was the sultan and I wanted to get the kids, I could not have dreamt up a better model than the summer camp model. Wow. Everybody, you've heard it here first, Rabbi Waiwai Rubenstein, summer camps are very dangerous. It's not just sending your kids away to Eretz Yisrael when they're 20 or 18 for a few years. Sending a, a, a 6, 7, 8, 9, 10-year-old away to summer camp is, can be really dangerous. Yes, yes. I'll tell you an interesting story. I sent my late, as I mentioned before, my late wife died from cancer. And uh, so I had two doctors at the time. One was, I'm trying to get the ages right, I think one was 12 and one was 14, something like that. And I was doing lecture. I was still living in England, and I was lecturing over America. And somebody recommended a, a summer camp. I won't say which one. And, and I asked friends, friends, good, really good people, who themselves had gone to this camp when they were young, young ladies. And they said it was great. Ramatosio afterwards told me I, I was completely wrong. It was not a great camp. I should have asked him before, of course, but I, I just trusted the other people. And, of course, things change and things evolve, and something that had a great reputation and was a good place might no longer be so. Anyway, my daughter, because her mother had died, was put in a bunk uh, with other troubled girls. But troubled girls in this case meant drugs, uh, sexual activity, etc., etc., there's nothing wrong with my daughter, nothing wrong with her, her Jewishness, her Yiddish kind. Now, but before we get to the effects of the other kids on, the administration of this, this camp, which is a well-known camp, there's another response, incidentally, which if you'll allow me to make. When I was in England, I fought and battled very, very hard for a number of years to expose somebody who was a fraud, a phony, and probably a pedophile. Probably. I couldn't get enough evidence. But he was certainly a liar and a fraud and, and, and had forged his qualifications but got involved in Chinuch. Well, pedophiles would, wouldn't they? Etc., etc. Anyway, in confronting people who had been fooled by this person, I found over and over and over again, despite offering them the evidence, they, when you show them that they should have done the due diligence, they should have checked this guy out and didn't, they are appalled for 24 hours. And then... They immediately go into defense, self-defense, and therefore defense of the person. They become complicit in the crime to cover up their own lack of responsible in inquiry to make sure that the guy uh, was uh, appropriate before they appointed him. And to this day, that, that, that phenomenon still occurs. So I certainly know of a couple of uh, frauds and phonies who I've dealt with and come across here in the United States and who are dealing with people. But the problem is, if I say, you know, Rabbi this, the guy you think who is Rabbi this is not, he's a fraud, the strange thing is people don't listen. And then you just become known as a troublemaker, and, and you just opened up a war, which you're going to lose because this, I don't know why, people won't listen. Maybe it's because they're embarrassed because they should have listened a long time ago. Okay, so let me, Rabbi, Rabbi Rubensi, let me just make a sort of a, a sequum of the year. You say the number one is dysfunction at home. It could be poverty, divorce, or some it could be illness, some other yes. severe yes. stress at home yes. that kids become, I guess, deeply unhappy and search for other avenues of trying to make a better life. Yes. Number two would be 
children who don't get into the school, it's one of the most embarrassing rejections that can happen to a person. Yeah. Um, and, and at such a young age, it's so they're so young the souls are so easily hurt and damaged, uh-huh. don't have defenses. Correct. And the third is, ironically, mechanchem, who don't have appropriate answers for what is a generation that has more questions because they're more exposed. Correct. So it's inequipped mechanchem. And the last one is sexual abuse. You say 85% of girls would occur to have yeah. some type of abuse. Yeah. And much of which you say happens at, for boys, certainly, at or girls, at summer camp. And parents are not aware of this. Yes. It's very powerful. And it's, I mean, we, let's, let's just put, you know, put our cards on the table here. Sexually abusing a child is almost, almost killing the child. And probably is killing the child. Well, I we, just we had Rob David Cohen on who said that a sexual molester has the din of a radif. Exactly. And I just heard a horrible story recently of a fellow who had been sexually molested by his, his uh, bar mitzvah teacher. He had, he got the, uh, but he, he responded to the therapy uh, well. He was counseled. He had a good psychologist. And he settled down, got married, overcame it, had his own children, and everybody thought of him as... Uh, you know, the paradigm of, of how you can conquer this sort of thing, until the night before his own son's bar mitzvah, where he cut his wrists. Really? How sad. It, it lay there dormant. Everybody thought he'd go over it. He don't. If you are sexually abusing a child, you're killing that child. So is it fair to say, if, 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 the, dinner, if, the, if, the, if the abuser has the dinner of a right if, Yes. And somebody does not report the molester, yes. be it a friend, a relation, a rebbe, a teacher. So doesn't the Rambam say that there's a love, leisachis ein cha'olav, that to be have rachmanis on the roidif is an issa daraisa? And they think they're being pious, and they're not only endangering somebody's life, but they're actually becoming, assisting a roidif. That's right. They become complicit. And I think the way you put it is appropriately strong, maybe not strong enough. Um, I, look, there's a wonderful, <coughs> there's a wonderful um, uh, set of forum, Halachas forum, by Professor Abram Sofer Abram, who's very close to, if I remember rightly, Shlomo Zalman, or uh, maybe it was Rabbi Ashraf. I can't remember which of the two Gedalim, but certainly for the fact of one of the two to him on this, on this front was, and this is written quite, quite clearly in the forum, if a child is being sexually molested, there's not the slightest doubt that you go to the police. Yeah, ah. I'll tell you something. We had we had Reb David Cohn say this on this program, yeah. and subsequently, I had a a, a very well known Rosh Hashiva refuse to come on the show because of Reb David Cohn's psak. He was so upset about Reb David Cohn's psak, he said, "I cannot appear on the program after he had agreed to, because he was so anti reporting molesters." Well, all I can tell, well, maybe you can go back to the Rashim and say that don't worry about Reb David Khan. Your objection is to either Reb Shlomo Zaman or Reb Yashiv. Well, Reb Yashiv, Reb Yashiv had a very nuanced, difficult answer. He said, first you have to go to, to, to a Bezdin. Reb David Khan says you go straight to the police. Right. So and in that case, Reb Shlomo Zaman said the same thing. Listen to this. He said, ah, but what if the children are taken away and put in a home? Still, you go to the police. What if they put with a non-Jewish family? He right. writes, still you go to the police. Because that's better than what's happening to them at the hands of a father yeah. who might be... I mean, it's, it's horrific. It's, 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 I, incidentally, uh, and maybe your listeners will be interested in this, because I, as you can hear, I, I feel passionately about this. All sexual abusers abuse again. It's never a one-off. Yeah. They're always repeat offenders. No, there's a brand new therapy which has just been developed, which I'm extremely, extremely excited about. It's called the throw them out of an airplane over an active volcano yeah. therapy. Yeah. Yeah. And I personally believe that, in fact, the statistics seems to show an almost zero reoffending. Yes. Yeah. I'm a big advocate yeah. of this. Well, David Cohn says put them in jail and throw away the keys. Thank you very much, Rabbi Rubenstein. It was really a pleasure having you on. <laughs> Thanks. God bless. Okay. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Fifty percent of our population are the distaff side women, girls. Let's go to somebody who's dedicated his life towards working with girls who are struggling with today's challenges. From New York, Rabbi Yisrael Grossberg, who's the principal of Benos Chaya Academy, and he's also the founder of Al Haderach. Welcome, Rabbi Grossberg. Thank you for having me. Rabbi Grossberg, it's an honor. Can you tell us 
a little bit, give us like a capsule of what does Benos Chaya do? Okay, so uh, Benos Chaya is a high school for girls that have been uh, asked to leave their school, the school that they're in, as well as um, girls that just have not, you know, they graduate elementary school and haven't been accepted to any other school and have nowhere else to go. So you're really, you're really doing Hashem's work here, I take it? I'd like to think so, yes. Are you the only school in America that, that sort of works with girls like this? Uh, as far as I'm aware, we're definitely the only school in America, as well as um, pretty much the world. We have girls that come in from uh, California, from Eric Charles, from England. We've had girls from England uh, recently. So there really isn't another school that I'm aware of, at least, that's doing this kind of work. A very difficult question because it's so broad. What is the leading cause or slash causes of children to, you know, go off the derech, substance abuse, and, um, you know, the whole gamut of different issues? What are the leading causes? <laughs> that, that is the million-dollar question. Uh, because if we can really isolate you know, a specific cause, then we could hopefully eradicate it. But you know, unfortunately, it's it's much broader than than you know than just one cause or even uh, you know to narrow it down to two or three causes. But if I had to really pinpoint the issues, um, it comes from the students that are that lack self confidence. Now that may sound like an oversimplification. So when you lack self confidence, you know that's why you go to the death. But often that self lack of self confidence comes from so many different places. It could be the child who was bullied and just feels like, you know, they're nobody to be the child who uh, perhaps in school was made to feel that they're, you know, second class. It could be the child who, through uh, abuse or other unfortunate incidents in their lives, were made to feel that they're second class. But, the, you know, this, the, the current system that we have is one where, you know, we strive, and as, as, you know, in many ways it should be, we strive for perfection, but unfortunately falling short of that perfection leads to a very deep inner turmoil to a teenager, and that causes them to look for other places to get that, uh, that kishmak. What are the early warning signs? Because, you know, an ounce of prevention is always in life worth a pound of cure. Rahman al you're a teacher, or more likely listening, a parent, and you have a daughter. What should send alarm bells to you? So... Both the idea of seeing a student who is struggling, um, that you know, their self-confidence has taken a hit, um, whether it be that you know, they were normally, they had been top of the class and all of a sudden things are, are turning around, they had been popular and things are going downhill. Uh, these sometimes are you know, indicators that, you know, not necessarily that anyone's going off, but that, you know, to be careful. Um, and to find other ways for that child to feel good about themselves. So if you have a student that's struggling um, educationally, so maybe get them art lessons so that they shine in, at art. Send them to camp so that they can be the one who um, you know, so is head of drama, et cetera, these kind of things. But giving them a feeling that, yes, I do belong. Yes, you know, maybe educationally, scholastically, I might not be top of the bunch, but I, there are enough areas that I shine that I feel good about myself. There's, it's, if I had to... Sc- it's about the child, a child who feels good about themselves, you say, will not go off the derrick and do drugs. Yeah, again, I mean, it's hard always to make, uh, you know, a, hard fast rules. But, yeah. but that seems to... So right, because parent, they're, not, they're not looking for any alternative. Right. So you're uh, saying, that's, in terms of looking for, for indicators that a problem is, is, you know, is when they are looking for some other thing. Maybe it'd be to dress a certain way because then they're going to, you know, feel more special, or to hang out with a certain crowd that might not be so appropriate, but then they're going to feel special. If they're looking for other ways to feel special, that's a, a, you know, an indication that there's something missing that they're filling in with perhaps you know, not the best ways. Now you're a parent, so you say, make your f- child feel better, but let's say you pissed that the child's on drugs. W- what's the next step? Okay, so, I mean, this is really one of the biggest challenges that uh, many parents are facing because of um, there really isn't much in the way of preparing parents for this. And, like, it's almost putting someone on stage, changing the script at the last second, and expecting them to be an expert. And it's, it's very difficult. Um, you know, it, it, there's, there really is, it, it, it's difficult to say just accept, 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 because sometimes that sends the wrong message to the child as well. Um, I've had students who say, well, Shabbos can't be that important. 
because when I break it in front of my parents, they still give me a hug and kiss. Therefore, I, I always push parents to, to really to work on this concept of acceptance, that we accept them. That doesn't mean that you have to approve of everything that they're doing. So that was my next question going to be. You sort of preempted me. I know there are those who believe strongly acceptance, 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 but where do you draw the... Does acceptance have to have boundaries? Yeah, I, I believe that it does, and I think you know, it's all about how those boundaries are presented. You know, if, if you sit a child down and, and really explain to them that it's not about them being bad, that they're not dressing to in the house. It's not about the, you know, something they're doing wrong or something they're doing bad, but rather something about just family ruach that we're trying to create, um, something that you know, is more within the boundaries of you know, the comfort level of the family, it's presented totally different. It's not you're doing something wrong. You're dressing it appropriately. You're bad. It's none of that. It's more about how can we work together as a family unit to make everyone comfortable. And I think that, you know, that presentation really is you know, the, the key to um, keeping that successful relationship with the child. Is there a good place to send girls for rehab that is within, you know, you know, Bederich Saba, you know, that is religious? Or is, like, are there any good religious rehab places? Um, currently, there are none that, you know, that I'm aware of. And honestly, it, it's a tremendous risk, you know, when you send a child there because you're, in a way, saying that we're putting the Yiddish type completely on the back burner, but... You know, generally these are cases of pikuach nefesh, and you know that that's the proper thing to do based on the psak of many gedolim. That you know, right now is not the time to worry about whether they're going to get holy soul there or not. But um, it, it's it's difficult. It's very difficult and very painful for the parent. You know, I saw from Lord Rabbi Sachs of England. He said, "Maha avoida hazayis lachem," and I may be corrupting his pshat drop, but he said the Ben Harusha says, he says the Ben Harusha. Like, you know, as, as Eden, do we believe that there are children who are Rishayim? So he says, the Ben Harash is telling you, He's saying, pa, you know, Abba, Ima, Papa, the Dad. What, he says, what kind of funny avoid is this that how I feel about myself, my needs, my emotional health, it doesn't seem to be important. It's become all about rite and ritual. He says, what about the fact that I feel terrible about myself? Right. He, that's what he right. teaches, it's, 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 which is very... Well, if somebody I mean, wants... I, I, go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. Just to, 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 I think a lot of that will boil down to, you know, relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. There's something that's lacking. I'm not here, obviously, to, to knock the system, but there, there are you know, thousands of uh, Talmudim and Bishapu girls that are Masiyah, but at the end of the day, so many of them don't even understand the concept of a relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And, and that the Yiddishkeit can be their Yiddishkeit. And, and I think, you know, that, that speaks to a lot of what you just said, uh, speaks to a lot about, you know, why some people are so quick, you know, to, to be 20 years, they're keeping, you know, Kashrus, and all of a sudden the next day they're reading Chaza. It was never meaningful to them. There was never a relationship there, and that's, I think, something that needs to be worked on. Well, Rabbi Grossberg, the Rabbi Nishalom should give you Kayach, you do Mama, you do the real Avaida Sakaidash, something... Uh, you can, I'm sure that you have psakim that you can answer the phone on Shabbos any time. I'm sure you've received those psakim. But yeah. I, I wanted to, on behalf of the whole Seber, to give you a big yashikayach, yechelech l'araisa, and you should be matzvayach. Amen. Thank you so much. All the best. Well, also, bye-bye. Well. Somebody who's been doing this for 19 years and has done thousands of interventions, a tzadikus of a woman, Ruchama Klapman. From Brooklyn, Ruchama Klapman who's the founder and executive director of MASK, Mothers and Fathers Aligned to Save Kids. Welcome, Ruhama. Thank you. Can you tell us in a snapshot of what MASK does? Sure. Um, I started MASK 19 years ago, and it, it, it's for parents and community, neighbors, family, relatives, rabbis reach out on our helpline. Um, we have a helpline for referrals. We offer support groups. Um, we're in the schools. We do programs in the schools for the kids. We have social work interns working with the kids in the schools uh, for prevention. And we have um, staff trainings. We do programs with many other agencies. We collaborate in doing programs together on different 
mental health issues, including drugs, alcohol, gambling, internet addiction, um, and all mental health issues. So, Ruhama, let me ask you, what would you respond to parents who feel really horribly guilty, they can't sleep at night, they feel that they've done something wrong, they may be right or very often they're wrong. Like, you know, it's just, they live, we live in a society that is particularly treacherous. It's probably harder today to bring up kids than ever. But what would you tell a parent like this who's just crying their eyes out to sleep every night? They see their kids either on drugs, off the derrick, whatever it may be. Um, t- talk to that. From when I started MASK, where on the helpline parents call daily, we case manage every single day. Uh, parents that call, and um, they call late uh, in the old days, uh, where they'll call once the kid is already on drugs, and they are crying on their pillows every day. They've tried everything, and our message is to those parents, our message is what Dr. Twersky once said at one of our symposiums, that it doesn't help to feel guilty There is no manual for parents, you know, how to raise children. There's no, you know, like recipe on what to do and what not to do. Every parent does the best they can, and usually parents are the last to know when their kid is doing anything that is out of the family way. So by the time parents do find out, they're already either getting kicked out of school or they have bad friends and they kids didn't share it with them. So to those parents whose kids are further along, to those parents I say, stop beating yourself up. Call MASS. Call another agency, any agency that's working with families. We can refer you to people in your neighborhood and whatever your family's direction from Kite. Uh, whatever modern, whatever it is that you want, we will help get you the help you need in order to help your child, whatever they're going through. Beating oneself up is just not going to make a change. Come, dial our number. Uh, Is it okay if I give out our number? Absolutely. Mask's number is 718-758-0400. Parents could call anonymous. Call up, describe what's going on, and we will help direct you. We're trained in in all the areas in order to get you the help you need uh, with your insurance, no charge for groups, um, whether it's rehab, whether it's for the parent or the child or the siblings that are being affected. Don't sit at home and just cry. Crying, you can dive into Hillem. Davening is the most important, but you need to do um, your established, which is going out and getting help. Years ago, David, we were not so lucky like we are today. Years ago, over the years when I started MASK, there was no agencies out there when I started MASK. Today, we have many, many, many good professional people. I'm a um, board member of Nefesh International, which has over 750 from therapists around the world. I mean, we can get people, we get, you know, calls from around the world, and our goal is to get the family's help. What would you say, Ruhama, to people who believe that the way to deal with them is with strictness or with yelling and anger? How would you respond to that? So my answer is that we are um, we bring to our family what we're used to from our family growing up. That's n- natural. So if somebody is used to being, you know, our parents maybe were stricter or someone's parents, you know, if the parents are not on the same page, let's say the mother says, oh, I, I, even though my child's Mahala Shabbos, even though my daughter's going dressed inappropriately, I still want her to live at home. I want to be nice to her. I want to, you know, go with her on the street, show that I'm proud of her, even though 
um, all those negative things that are going with against the family, and the husband is saying, no, I want her out of the house. I want him out of the house. I don't want to deal with him. I want to cut him off. Don't give him money. Our belief system is that mask is mothers and fathers aligned saving kids. Our belief system is both parents need to be on the same page, whatever that page is going to be, in order to help their kid turn around and get healthy. And screaming, yelling, cutting them off, I cannot begin to beg you enough to make you realize it doesn't work. It'll just make them further and further and further away. Ruchama, you're Tzadekis. And the Brian Shalom should give you Kayach to continue your amazing work. Amen. Thank you, David, for bringing this to the public. Let's finish now with a success story. And there are many, and I personally know many. We have with us on the phone from California, Yehuda, who is really a remarkable story, a boy who struggled mightily and put himself firmly back on his feet and I thought it was important to have him on the show because so many kids or parents they just lose hope that they could put it back together again so let's hear from a success story welcome Yehuda thank you thank you for allowing me this opportunity to uh, share my experience with people out there that may be in similar situation as I you know I was about a year and a half ago that I was struggling immensely with different things in my life, primarily substance abuse. How did your parents sure. deal with it? They didn't take it too well at first. And, you know, they, I don't think they, they knew what to do. They were at a loss. And uh, as clueless as I was, they were uh, in a quandary themselves. They didn't really how were you doing going. at school during this period? I wasn't in school anymore. It caused me to drop out uh, around the age of 16 or so. And, you know, went to work, couldn't keep a job, uh, couldn't maintain friendships, relationships, anything of this sort. And tell us, where are you today? So, uh, very quickly, I, I was, I'm out here in California for a year plus already, around 15 months. But, um, thank God, Baruch Hashem, today I, I have friends that I can never have imagined having, people that really care and uh, you know so what what message would you tell to either kids who are struggling or parents or just lay people who know somebody who's struggling kids that are struggling i could i could just say one thing you know a lot of times it's hard for us to listen to to other people around us we think we know better we're all caught up in our delusions and things but we just have to know that you know, there are people out there that really care for us. Yehuda, thank you so much for sharing your story, and Brandon Shalom should give you continued Hatzlacha. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Ultimately.